I'd like now to introduce um, our speaker for this evening, Glenn Benson, who is our curator of artifacts here at the Society. Um, his day job is at the Victoria and Albert Museum, but he very beautifully curates all of our artifacts. And I think being a curator of artifacts has got to be the best job title of all time. Um, Glenn will also show us one of the Linnaean learning videos that's been made by our staff here, which you can, if you want to see the rest of them, you can go to YouTube and, and look them up under Linnaean learning podcasts and videos, and you can see all of those. So, Glenn, over to you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Um, we're going to go through on a romp through the herbarium cupboard. So. Thank you. Um, so yes, I'm the curator of artifacts, which means that I look after all the things that are not biological, botanical, that are not art, that are not books. So this desk is mine. The light fittings are mine. Uh, <laughs> The chair, sorry, the, the chair with the crocodile skin. Um, the clock, and I really must get around to winding it. Um, so, um, so I'm going to rely on my mobile phone. So we, say, um, we have curators for different parts of the collection, and I look after the artifacts. And you may remember that back in 2016, we launched a campaign to conserve the herbarium cabinet, which has become nicknamed Herbie. And that's not in any way to be um, disrespectful to what's a very important piece of furniture um, that's in the collection, but um, it became just shorthand in lots of emails. It was much easier to say that than Linnaeus's, Linnaeus's Herbarium Cabinet or Linnaeum Cabinet. So we decided to go for Herbie, um, and it stuck. So I'm going to break with tradition at the Society, and I'm going to start my talk with thank yous. Uh, this is the famous Painswick Church, um, St. Mary's Painswick, with its 99 new trees, possibly 103, depending on how you count them, because there are many, many people to thank um, that have got us to this point, um, of, uh, of, to the point where we can actually unveil Herbie. And there's just running through a few here. So we have to start off with Grand Lucas, because remember back in 2016 when we started the campaign, it was to mark um, Gren leaving us as our treasurer. Um, and through the Adopter Lynn's um, scheme, we decided to put Herbie in that scheme, and many, many fellows have supported us in that. The Society also underwrote the cost of the project as well, um, which was several thousand pounds. And I also have to thank the Garfield Western Foundation, who have paid for the cases upstairs, the discovery room downstairs, and for Herbie's cabinet. So if you haven't explored upstairs and downstairs yet, Please do so uh, later. Um, but we have to thank them a great deal. Um, there's a few people whose names are up there who've all played their part in making um, today happen. And, and I'm very grateful to all those people. And I also wanted to thank the staff of the society. Um, and to the point, I actually think these deserve a round of applause. <laughs> seen today is a huge team effort. Every single person in the society's staff has been involved, whether it be Priya looking after the money at one end of the spectrum, through to people clambering up ladders and adjusting labels and cleaning glass at the other end of the spectrum. So every single member of the team has been involved and they really do deserve that applause. This is the team making faux specimen uh, sheets for Herbie. Um, we didn't want to put historic ones into the cabinet because, of course, they're too light sensitive. So this is from our Twitter feed. So I'm sure you're all on Twitter. We have a terrific Twitter feed um, with lots of wonderful pictures of our, of our team and our activities. So this is the very dry definition of a herbarium. Um, and I desperately tried to think of something more uh, uh, snappy than that, but it does seem to be the official one. And rather than me talk to you about herbarium, I'm going to leave it to the film that we've made with the team. Um, and it features this chap. This is Linnaeus looking very dapper and very slim. Uh, this is from a 1950s paper doll that we have in the collection. Um, I showed this to a colleague of mine at the BNA who said, why has he got a, um, a carpet sweeper? <laughs> No 
know, we all know that's his vasculum. Um, but as I say, to, the, to my curator friend, that was a carpet sweeper. Um, so, um, so you're going to see this chap running around the film, and you're going to see this chap here lugging his great basket of herbage in to, to be analysed by these uh, botanists, horticulturalists, doing it the old-fashioned way, uh, not the Linnaeus way. <laughs> This old rickety cabinet belonged to the father of taxonomy, Carl Linnaeus, and was used to house specimens that could later be studied, a bit like how you use the folders on your computer today. On its shelves sat hundreds of herbarium specimens, plants that have been preserved by pressing them flat onto sheets of paper. Linnaeus filed these plants onto the shelves of his cabinet using his sexual system. They were arranged according to their sexual reproductive organs, stamens and pistils. Linnaeus grouped plants with the same number of stamens, the male reproductive part of the flower, together. With 24 groups, some plants might have one stamen, others would have two, and so on, all the way up to 24. So each shelf in this clever cabinet represented one of those groups. If two different plants each had, say, five stamens, they would simply be put in a group together on the fifth shelf. My name's Dr Mark Spencer, and I'm a fellow of the Linnaean Society, and I'm the curator of these botany collections. This collection is still arranged using Linnaeus's sexual classification, and this old classification is the basis of the modern science we do today. However, we use other techniques today, including DNA science, to create modern classifications. In the 1600s, plant specimens would be collected and mounted on pages inside bound books, but this wasn't ideal for botanists examining data. The plants themselves could be damaged when turning the pages, and it was difficult to compare new plants with those already fixed into a book. Linnaeus realised this. This is why he decided to mount his plants on separate loose pieces of paper, which could then be arranged in the cabinet according to his classification system. This allowed Linnaeus to be more flexible. He could easily take out a specimen, compare it with a newly collected plant, and then, if needed, revise the order in which they were arranged on the cabinet shelves. Linnaeus's classification has changed a lot. But classification is even more important now. Modern science depends on an understanding of where things are in the world. Classification helps us understand what plant or fungus we should study to make new medicines, new antibiotics, what crops to grow where. Without classification, we don't understand the world. Although Linnaeus's sexual system for classifying plants eventually fell out of favour for a more advanced approach, the simplicity of the cabinet system greatly advanced the field of plant classification. So much so that museums and universities all over the world still use it today. So thank you, the learning team, for, for that. Um, because I work for the VNA, I kind of like nice pictures of nice pictures. Um, so I'm throwing in a couple here. Um, I just love this picture. Um, this is from the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. And it kind of just picks up on the theme of the film in the, the old-fashioned way of, of, of doing um, sort of botanizing. So here we have this chap with what appears to be a piece of lily of the valley in his left hand. Um, well, scarily, he's used this rather hefty axe to cut it, by the looks of things. Um, <laughs> I think what he's also trying to tell us, of course, is that though he's a man of war, because he has a sort of a weapon in his right hand, he's also a man of learning and understanding. Um, but it's just interesting to compare 
the, you know, the valley in his hand with what's in the book just here. So this is kind of that sort of what the, the other film sort of picks up on. This is a very fanciful uh, view of, of Linnaeus preparing his herbaria sheets. Um, we can see him here as if we're peering in through his window to see him sort of preparing them. This is a modern medal. We don't actually have this in the collection. Uh, if anyone's got one and would like to donate it to us, it would be quite nice. But I thought what we should do this afternoon is just kind of think about where has Herbie come from. And again, it's an excuse to show this rather lovely picture. This is the currently thought to be the oldest image of a bookcase. Um, it's from the oldest um, Vulgate Latin Bible, which is currently sitting in Tuscany, though it is due to come to the British Library uh, either later this year or early next year for their exhibition on Anglo-Saxon uh, design. Um, but it, as far as we know, this claims to be the first depiction of a bookcase with doors. Now, I'm sure you can all think of examples in sort of illustrated manuscripts of sort of scribes sitting before shelves of books, but this is meant to be the first with actual doors. I'm not saying Linnaeus copied this, it's just I'm saying there's a long tradition of cabinets with doors. Similarly, uh, this is just an example of Johannes Kentman's uh, fossils cabinet. Um, and here it was described in a book of 1565, and it's a cabinet where someone is actually bringing some sense and some order to his collection. This is no cabinet of curiosities. Uh, this is nothing, this is not for entertainment. This is someone applying some knowledge and some classification and some sort of taxonomy to his collection of stones, including stones removed from human beings. Um, which he had them meticulously drawn. He was a, a doctor as well as a bit of a uh, geologist, zoologist, and quite a tal multi-talented man. But I say, um, he also collected the stones that he removed from his patients and added them to his cabinet. Also at this period, the concept of the office begins. So office furniture dates from around the kind of late 17th century. In 1688, you hear people talking about pigeonholes. Um, in terms of, of applying it to a piece of furniture. Famously, people like Chippendale created um, pigeonholes and the like in his cabinets. But here we've got an example from the early 18th century. And this is no comment on Brexit, by the way. Okay? Uh, it just happens to be French, um, but also it's where the word comes from. So the idea of a, of a bureaucracy, of the idea of being ruled from the desk, if you like, comes along. But look at the thing in the background. Here we have some loose papers being stored in a giant set of pigeonholes. Again, I'm not saying that Linnaeus looks at these, but these sort of things are coming along at roughly the same time. This bringing of order. Um, we get the first office blocks being built uh, in this sort of period in the early 1700s, particularly for the navies of Western Europe. And Linnaeus' herbarium cabinet, Herbie, um, is famous enough to feature on the back of a medal. Um, again, we don't own this medal. So again, if anyone's got one and would like to donate it to us, we'd, uh, we'd like that. Um, but it just sort of shows us how famous, perhaps almost there's a sort of mythical mystique about um, the cabinet and how it transformed the way we practice botany. So I've got some quotations, um, uh, which I'm gonna be flagging up. Um, which I won't sort of um, read out here, um, but the important part of this sentence is for use, not for show. And I think that's an important thing I just want you to rem remember. Um, because I think we're dealing with cabinet that is at the start of Linnaeus' thinking about his herbarium and how he organizes um, plants. And he's building a very practical, functional piece of furniture. Um, Again, here, I would just point out, um, this is some correspondence where um, Smith is trying to persuade his father to give him the money to buy the Linnaean collections. And, and he talks about, you get these wonderful descriptions of the fact that there's this room that was uh, contained various cabinets uh, for the housing of various parts of Linnaeus's collection. Um, I quite like the idea that they were sort of, even in those days, he's thinking about protecting it. He puts it in a separate building to keep it uh, protected from fire. Um, something we kind of think of as very modern, but there he is doing it 200 odd years ago. And 
this photograph here, which is from the 1930s, um, shows this very room with um, Herbie here, roughly on this wall over here. So the Collier portrait, the famous Collier portrait of Darwin, um, as you can see, hasn't really moved very much. He moved a little bit to the left at one point so we could get uh, Wallace in, um, but generally, um, here we are. Um, but it's where we start to get documentary evidence for the existence of the cabinets within the society. So here are the council minutes of 1836 talking about um, the cabinets being placed in the meetings room. And thank you to Gina for finding this picture. Um, I actually think we should go back to this double picture hang. Uh, so it's very Victorian. So. Here are our here on the right-hand side on, uh, is the cabinets as they appeared in 1907, um, and is, is a much reproduced image of our then three herbarium cabinets. Um, and there's an illustration on this side from an early sort of encyclopedia of gardening, um, which features them. And I want you to just take note, sorry the people on the right, but just take note of the feet. These are gonna become quite important in our discussion as we go along. Um, because it helps to determine which cabinet's which. So you can see here, there's quite a simple um, foot on this cabinet and slightly more decorative ones on the ones either side. And that tallies here and here. And also this is, turns out to be an important thing. These are the envelopes that the herbarium sheets were placed in to protect them. Um, and we learn a little bit more about that later on. So which of those three cabinets is Herbie? Um, it's hard to tell. I have a theory, and my theory is that it, we, we have cabinet on the left. Why I think that is because if you look at the feet, so this, is, this one's in Sweden. You may remember that the society gave back two of the cabinets to Sweden in the 1930s. Um, counts, the, the minutes of the society of around 7th of April 1938 record the fact that it was decided that we would send two of the cabinets back. I'm wondering if those are the two cabinets that we sent back and that's the reason why they were photographed. And if you look at this cabinet here, and again, sorry, those people over there, you can see slight diamond shapes in the wood. The raking light of the photograph has picked up um, the fact that there are these um, diamond shapes in the door. It's not in this one, because this is the middle one, that's that one, with its simpler feet. Over here, on the very far right, so this one here, um, you can see that diamond pattern again in the, in the door. So I'm going to stick my neck out and say that our Herbie is the one on the left. Um, interestingly, during conservation, we noticed that it has a slight lean to its left, its proper left. Um, so, and this one does need a bit of, a, bit of a lean to its left. So I asked my myself the question, how do we know it's real? Um, and it po that question was posed by other people previously. And actually going through archives and other material, tracking down um, some elusive kind of docket that says, hey, this is how much you've paid for um, Linnaeus's collection via Smith, and here's a sort of list of all the things you bought. It doesn't really exist as far as we know. Um, but when this um, report was done in the 1890s, um, it had a very similar um, thing here where the, the the author is saying, I'm finding it difficult to find out this information. So let's look for some evidence. Um, this is a letter that we have in the archive. Uh, it goes to great lengths to explain about the number of plants, the quality of the books, uh, and all the other things that Smith is buying. No mention of the cupboards. And this caused a lot of discussion amongst us as we were preparing for today. Um, but I think at the time, uh, the cabinet, Herbie, was just seen as a useful piece of furniture that held this very important herbarium collection. Um, so it doesn't warrant being mentioned. Um, we get a little bit, an idea that something's happening um, because Smith is praised um, for buying the Linnaean cabinet. Um, I, I do love the idea of a botanic empire. So. And again, um, we have some from the proceedings of the society. Um, a 
again, talking about the cabinets being placed in the meeting room, and just to remind ourselves, here is the image um, from the 30s showing the cabinets in, in their position. And writing in 1924, uh, Britain talks about the um, specially devised envelopes. We saw that one sort of propped up at the front of the cabinet in the early picture. Um, but so these are all, um, and here he's talking about the fact that the, the cabinets are painted green. Uh, and that is true. What we've discovered is they were green. And it's with age, uh, or maybe later intervention, that they turned black. So Herbie now looks black, but he was originally green. So, here. so um, here's Joe um, doing his kind of Hercules impression of holding up the pillars of that. Um, but also, it's quite useful just to show how tall Herbie is. He's about 2.4 meters tall. The case he lives in is about 2.6 meters tall. So it's quite a substantial piece of furniture. And I'm, from all accounts that I've ever read, Linnaeus was quite a short chap. <laughs> Um, so it's interesting that he went, he went so tall. Um, even today, the average age of a Swede, uh, the average height of a Swede is only something like 1.8 meters. So um, according to Google. So famously, um, Linnaeus gives us a description of his herbarium cabinet, or at least he gives us a description of how you should build your herbarium cabinet. And I think that's an important difference. He's telling the readers of his book what's the best way to store your herbarium collection. And he goes to great lengths to explain the dimensions um, and things like that. And it's worth just bearing in mind this famous image here that's sort of um, reproduced quite frequently um, because that's going to crop up again and again as we go forward. It's also what makes, oops, sorry, excuse me, what makes things slightly difficult is the fact that lengths and definitions of lengths have changed. The metric system doesn't really come along until the end of the 18th century. So we're dealing with a whole variety of feet and inches and things like that. And various scholars, uh, Willie Stern being probably the most famous of them, has tried to decipher all of those uh, different measurements in relation to the herbarium cabinet and other parts of the collection. So again, we're doing a bit of comparative anatomy. We have the famous sketch in the middle we have one of the cabinets that's on display in Sweden. Notice it's not one of ours, because ours have different feet. And then on the right hand, on this one here, is our Herbie. And what I tried to do was just to compare some of the dimensions. And thank you again to um, various members of the society team who clambered up ladders um, with tape measures to try and measure all the different angles and, and distances and lengths. So I'm just trying to compare how Linnaeus's description of what the perfect herbarium cabinet should be with how Herbie turned out. Um, and there are some differences and there are some similarities. Um, I think the most important thing to note, and this will come up this later, is where it says originally, because the cabinet was deepened at some point in its history. Another one point, about 13 millimeters, was added to the depth of Herbie at some point in its life. Um, so there's, there is this slight difference in dimensions. Also, the shelf thicknesses are interesting too, because the only shelf thick, the only shelf that meets the six lines category, and a, and a line, Willie Stern reckons, is 2.25 millimeters. So six of them would make about you know, uh, yeah, 13 or so millimeters thick. The only one that's really of that thickness is the very top one. The rest of our shelves are about eight millimeters. These are cabinets that are on display in Sweden. Um, but again, I must stress, they are not the ones that we returned in the 1930s. Um, whether they are later ones, um, whether they are amongst the many cabinets that was described in that earlier letter, we don't know. Um, they certainly fit the description and the sketch in, that Linnaeus gives us in 1751 better and I think, again, my argument is I think our herbarium cabinets, and in particular Herbie, is much earlier than these ones. And thank you for the people who sent me the photos. Um, you can see here, a little bit as we talked about in the film, that the shelves uh, are actually numbered and so on. And the other important difference here is that these cabinets have got notches that go all the way to the front of the central style. And that's a, a critical difference between these cabinets and our ones. 
So I started to think, well, how old is Herbie as a result of this? And of course, Herbie's got to be older than 1751, otherwise he wouldn't have appeared in the, uh, he wouldn't have been described in the book. Equally, um, I'm going to stick my neck out and say I think he must be older than the 1730s, um, because here we have Linnaeus working for George Clifford in the 1730s. Clifford gives uh, Linnaeus um, a number of specimen sheets, and Linnaeus has to cut them down to fit them into his herbarium cabinet. Of course, we don't know what, what period he does that, um, but I think it's interesting that he is already, at, that, at some point, so if you're, my, my feeling about Linnaeus is, if you were given 120 of these spectacular um, specimen sheets with their wonderful sort of Dutch-style um, ornamentations on them, um, he would have been desperate to cut them down and put them in his cabinet and make them fit. But we don't really know the age of Herbie. The other thing I just wanted to pick up on is that Herbie's had a very nomadic existence. Um, 200 odd years later, uh, uh, having been acquired by Smith, we're eventually kind of getting a permanent home. But I, it, the list actually grew to be quite long with the number of times he moved, whether it be from Uppsala to the Swedish coast, onto ships, to the UK, around the UK, um, and so on. So there's just a few here, and it gives me an excuse to put my favourite image um, of the uh, Sammy carrying the boat uh, onto, a, onto a slide. Once Herbie gets to Burlington House, there's still a nomadic existence to be had. And in the bicentenary um, history of the society, it actually goes to great lengths to explain the various locations that Herbie has occupied over the years and in, 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 in great detail. And I love the fact back in kind of 19, sort of this period, the cabinets were left in a lumber room. Uh, so you remember at this point, we've still got all three. Um, and again, I, I'm fascinated, coming from a museum world, as to how things cross the line from being an everyday object to becoming a museum object and the way we treat them in a different way. Um, I see that at work a lot. We have um, chairs that we have examples of in the collection, and we have chairs, the same chairs that we have in our offices. Um, and the ones in our offices are labelled, this is not an object. Okay? <laughs> Um, and the ones that are, that are in the collection are very clearly labelled, this is an object, so don't sit on me anymore. Um, so uh, uh, I think it's a fascinating journey. In the early days, we, so Smith is saying, I've got this amazing collection, no mention of the cabinets. Um, we get them here, and though we put them in a very prominent position in the most, one of the most important rooms in the building for us, um, we still treat them just as bits of furniture containers, almost, um, for the herbarium uh, collection. And this is how I remember um, Herbie when I first uh, joined the society, um, was it lurking in the basement outside the vault. Uh, and I must admit, I was one of the people who thought it was just a cupboard. It was uh, Elaine, our librarian, who said, you do know that list of Linnaeus is cupboard, don't you? And that started a whole series of discussions which ultimately led to um, the launch of the campaign in 2016 to have the cabinet um, conserved. And here is Tristram, our conservator. Uh, Tristram works for the VNA. He's a contract conservator, um, and he uh, tended for um, conserving Herbie. Um, this is his standard picture of him poised over an object uh, with his purple gloves on, which are sort of standard issue in the VNA. Um, but it begins to show you um, the sort of inside of the cabinet, that, um, which will become more important as we go along. So this is Herbie before we start the conservation. Um, so again, with it lurking in the downstairs corridor, um, you can see here with damage on the feet, damage around the locks, and, and so on. Um, the important thing about Herbie is he's made out of single sheets of timber. The sides are single sheets. The doors are single sheets. Um, and you can, there is natural scuffing uh, and things in, in the wood. And with modern approaches to conservation, you don't try and make things look new. What you're trying to do is to sort of um, deal with the, the damage, um, try and reduce further damage. Um, but also you might look at an object and think, does some other damage distract your eye? As human beings, we are drawn to um, 
things that are wrong, if you like. So the typical technique with conservation these days is to just blend those in so that you concentrate on the object rather than concentrating on the damage. And that's what Tristram's done in some of these. So it's done in a reversible way. It's all documented so that we know what are the, um, the true original parts and what are the modern invent, uh, inven inventions. So this is her, the after conservation, and you can see we've blended in that damage around the lock. We've sorted out the feet. Um, but again, what's interesting about these pictures is, is looking at these cabinets. Think back to those cabinets that are on display in Sweden, which I'm saying are not out. Herbie doesn't, isn't painted red throughout the inside. Um, the arrangement of the shelves are different and so on. But we've got our feet um, just as a reminder of uh, these are the early uh, cabinets that we have in the, uh, that have been with us um, since Smith's time. So conserving an object gives you the opportunity to look at it very closely. Um, which, and it's been a great privilege to actually spend time with Herbie privately down the stairs in the Smith Herbarium room and various other locations around the society, just so you sort of get to know it. Um, because looking at it is very important. And I can sort of see the parallels between you know, um, comparative botany and what Linnaeus is all about with actually what I do for a living, which is to actually look and compare um, three-dimensional things primarily. So this is a bit text heavy, um, but I've tried to get a huge uh, technical report that Tristan produced for us into a sort of one slide. Um, but the sort of things that we have learned is that there's been many adaptations. Herbie has been fiddled with many times um, over his lifetime or her lifetime. Um, we certainly know that the shells were not designed to be removed, um, which is something that I think a lot of people imagined that they were. Some of the later shells, uh, some, in some of the later interventions, some of the shells have been cut out and put back in in different locations. So they've been made to be removable, but they certainly weren't removable when it was first constructed. Um, Tristan is convinced that the back of the cabinet has previously been taken off and put back on again. And certainly when it was put back on, the cabinet was made, as I say, a, about um, something like 13 millimeters deeper. Um, but that was very much from, from the back. We know from the paint analysis that we did that the outside of Herbie was indeed green, as those early um, accounts recalled. And certainly at the same time, the paints match in terms of, um, you can tell how the way the paint is applied as to whether the paints have been put in different orders. The inside cabinet, the red of the doors here, and the red central style were all painted at the same time. So the green on the outside and the red paint on the inside is contemporary. And both the red and the green are on a gray base color. And it's interesting with those cabinets in um, Sweden that they are painted gray uh, with red interiors. So here are some of the things we found. So this is the extra 13 millimeters that, we, that were put in the back of the cabinet. You can also see in this picture all the various times the shelves have been changed. Uh, this is the original one at the top um, with, with a groove that enabled the shelves to be slotted in during construction. They certainly would have been put in afterwards. They were put in as the, as the cabinet was constructed. We get to see where shelves have been glued in and have fallen out. We get to see places where um, shelves have been hacked out. Um, been sawn out of the cabinet at various points in its life. So this is a piece of furniture, like most pieces of furniture, and certainly most of the pieces of furniture I see every day at work, have all, over hundreds of years, will have been yeah, inevitably um, fiddled with uh, and altered to suit the need at the time. And I just picked out some quotations from um, minutes and things. Um, and it just re re reminds us that as a society, we have been doing those interventions and those adaptations and things to Herbie. Um, one of the things that really caught my eye was, was oops, sorry, big button, was this. List is a textiles term. It means a strip of fabric. And if you can look here, that sort of slight 
lovely purple color on the edge of this picture here. This is the list. It's a piece of fabric that's designed and, it, and it's woven in such a way that it doesn't unravel. So at some point, the society decided to sort of dust proof Herbie um, with strips of fabric. And as we'll see later, there are a number of numbering schemes that were applied to the shelves of Herbie over his lifetime. Just to go back to um, this whole business about the thickness of the shells momentarily, um, what we're looking at here is the very top part up here. So the enlargement is the very top part of the, um, the cabinet. And this is one of the few places where the shelves actually sort of get close to Linnaeus's specification of six lines thick. Um, but just say so generally, they're, they're much uh, um, slimmer. And here are the three different styles of labeling that have been applied to, to Herbie over the years. Um, and I've put them roughly in sort of chronological order here. And this is certainly how Tristram believes they've been uh, applied, because you can sort of tell by um, how they overlap one another. And interestingly, the, the, the sort of second series, it's interesting that it's made out of um, reused uh, manuscript, and I'm desperate <laughs> to try and fathom out what that says. Um, what, what, what little gems got torn up and folded up and turned into labels for Herbie um, at some point in his, in his life? Could there be some sort of critical fact on the back of that piece of paper? So, but as you saw from those previous quotations, those labels are, are of our doing. They're of the society's doing, I suspect. We also discovered um, that at some point Herbie was sealed with wax. If you look at the, towards the top of the doors and also at the bottom of the doors, um, there are remnants of sealing wax. Whether that was done on their transportation, as we saw, he's, been, he's had a nomadic life. Um, at some point, um, someone decided to seal the doors uh, with some kind of wax, but we don't know when. I also think we also just quickly need to touch on um, just how important we now know the cabinets are. We may have uh, just treated them as pieces of furniture in the past, but we now know that Herbie and his fellow herbarium cabinets are very important in terms of the history of the way that we study botany and the way that we um, store botanical specimens. And this is a lovely little sketch that appears in one of our letters. And thank you to Leone for finding it for me, um, because it's only tiny, um, so it's just here. So there's this lovely letter. Um, and what we're saying here is that Deval is saying to Smith, hey, I've copied your uh, herbarium cabinets. And of course, Smith's herbaria cabinets are based on those of Linnaeus. Um, so we have this nice little sort of link uh, through. And it's just in such a sweet uh, drawing. Um, I throw this one in just for sort of for a dramatic effect in that we have this very sort of stylized botanist um, at work. Um, and just to point out, in the back here is a 19th century version of um, Herbie uh, with his loose specimen sheets. Um, and the other thing that's quite nice here is that he's using a sort of botanical uh, microscope, which is very similar to the one we have on display downstairs um, from Robert Brown. All botanists go to work dressed like that, I think. So, right. and just to show how the tradition, if you like, that, that Linnaeus creates for loose leaf specimens uh, continues to the present day. And any of you work in herbaria, then you, this will be very familiar to you. But it's, a nice, it's nice to have that continuous link through, um, that once Linnaeus' system gets going, yes, it was questioned, yes, it was adapted, but the principle of being able to store your specimens in loose leaf specimen sheets, being able to take them out for direct um, and comparison is something that lives with us today. And I just threw this in. I was flicking through the v &A's catalog, and I thought, oh, that looks a bit Linnaeus-like. Um, so this is an IKEA bookshelf that the v &A was given in the 1990s. Um, but it's not a million miles um, from uh, the, the Herbarium Cabinet, really. And so, to my eye, I can sort of see the, uh, the similarities. So it's just a bit of whimsy there. So, 
we now finally have a resting place for um, Herbie. Um, after, what, 200 odd years of moving around, he's finally got somewhere to call home. Hopefully he won't ever be put down in the lumber room again. Um, and, um, and the poor chap has, um, has, has finally got somewhere to call home. And these are the technical drawings for the display case, which is out in the foyer, uh, that some of you might have seen on the way in. Um, and it just gives you some idea of the scale of this cabinet. So this is your architectural average person um, standing here. And what we're looking at is a cabinet, as I said earlier, is about 2.6 meters tall. So it's a really substantial um, uh, cabinet that Herbie has to live in because he's about 2.4 meters tall. Sorry, I'm calling him he. We don't know. Um, who knows where he, where he sits? Um, but a lot of effort, and particularly from the office team, um, and particularly with Helen Shaw and Elizabeth, um, who, to, to raise the money and to coordinate and project manage the installation of all these cases, um, and to make sure that this huge case just fitted under the stairs. Uh, there were moments, I think we all had those moments, where we all quietly sneaked out into the cook thing and just checked, um, just to make sure. Every now and again, I went down to see um, Herbie downstairs and just sort of stand by it and measure myself against it um, just to make sure it was actually going to fit. Um, but, um, and thanks to a great team effort, we carried it up the stairs and got him in uh, last week. And I'm just going to finish with uh, this quotation from uh, Edward Smith, which I think um, sums us up, really. Um, and in that we are trustees of this collection. You know, we are here to look after it for the future. Um, he realized that when he became first president. And I think it's a lovely quotation from him that he realizes the value of what he's said, uh, what he's brought to the UK, uh, and that we are custodians of it. And it is incredibly important, uh, both the collection and also Herbie. Um, and thank you very much.